Communication begins with a signal. Decode a species signals and you open a window on their world. Animals send signals to evoke responses and selection favors individuals who are able to get the responses that benefit them. Over evolutionary time, it's the genes of these individuals that survive and shape the species. The gulls of the North Atlantic have extensive repertoires of distinct displays. This, along with the ease of observing their behavior, led Nobel laureate Nico Tinbergen to choose gulls for his pioneering studies of animal signals. His insights shaped the emerging field of animal behavior. Generations of biologists have since built on this work. The result of these efforts is an understanding of animal communication and behavior, clearly revealing the signals gulls use to survive. Ten kilometers off the coastline of Maine and New Hampshire is a craggy archipelago known as the Isles of Shoals. At its heart, the 38 windswept hectares of Appledore Island. Every spring, these rocky shores and cliffs are inundated by an unruly breeding colony of great blackback gulls and herring gulls. The great blackback, Laris marinus, is the world's largest gull with wingspans of up to five and a half feet. As adults, they have dark gray backs, bright white heads, red eye rings, and thick yellow bills. The herring gull, Laris argentatus, is 40% lighter and 20% smaller than its imposing cousin. Adult herring gulls are distinguished by light gray backs and yellow eye rings. Herring gulls breed across North America and Northern Europe while blackbacks restrict their breeding to the marine and inland coasts around the North Atlantic. Both species crowd Appledore and other islands where terrestrial predators are rare. Blackbacks rule the island, mostly occupying relatively sheltered inland areas. Herring gulls nest more often on the exposed island edges. Both species kill and eat almost anything they can. But blackbacks are the island's apex predator, even preying on full-sized herring gulls. Appledore is home to the Shoals Marine Lab, offering scientists and students an ideal situation in which to observe the behavior and ecology of gulls. What appears to be chaos is in fact a network of discrete, meaningful behaviors. The screams and struts, the way they pull grass and hold their heads, each of these actions is a signal. There are signals of territoriality and aggression, of courtship and pair bonding, of juvenile needs and parental care, these are the three main categories of gull signaling behaviors. Signals of territoriality and aggression begin when herring and blackback gulls return to Appledore to mate and rear young. Year after year, the birds return to the same patch of rock where they bred the year before. Gulls remain mates for as long as their partnership continues to be reproductively successful. Some couples last a lifetime. Males arrive first, with their slightly smaller, more slender mates close behind. 
pairs cooperate to reestablish their territorial boundaries. The gulls space themselves an average of four to five meters apart, resulting in a matrix of abutting territories whose boundaries follow contours of the rugged terrain. There's no food in the territory. It only provides space in which to breed. For the next five months, through nesting, rearing, and fledging their young, the pair must defend their territory against predators, interlopers, and neighbors. It takes two able-bodied parents to do this. Foraging requires leaving the colony, but at least one parent has to be on the territory at all times to defend the boundaries and the young. If one parent is seriously wounded, the eggs and chicks will die. Along with them die the couple's reproductive output for the year. To defend their boundaries, gulls fight if they have to, often locking beaks in a determined tug of war. But fights are dangerous and energetically expensive for both combatants. Far safer than using beaks and wings, their preferred weapons are signals. Coexistence requires communication. a series of interactions, a dialogue of signals and responses. When signals fail, violence erupts. Herring and black-backed gulls have a large repertoire of shared signals that they use in territorial and agonistic interactions. The long call is an advertisement signal. It is the first line of defense, broadcasting occupancy and warding off trespassers. It can also be a directed threat. The mew is also used in disputes, often calling in support from a mate. The kek kek is used when the colony is disturbed by a predator or other perceived threat. It's used more pointedly in boundary disputes. The yao serves the same two functions. In addition to sounds, gulls use a variety of visual signals. These blackbacks are agitated, yowing at a distant threat. They're also making a characteristic visual threat display called an upright posture. The upright posture is rigid, neck stretched up and forward, head pointed slightly down. Wings are cocked forward and slightly off the sides, poised to attack. Compare this to the wing of a relaxed bird held seamlessly at the sides. Still more aggressive is the charge display, a form of ritualized attack. The signal is amplified by outstretched wings. All of these signals form a vocabulary of territoriality and aggression. They are used in varying combinations throughout the season to negotiate countless conflicts within the busy colony. This pair relaxes on their territory. A blackback from across the island, an interloper, approaches their border. The male heads him off with an upright posture, driving the intruder into an adjoining territory.
the neighboring pair charge, forcing the intruder to flight. Interlopers are rare, but heated disputes among neighbors are common. To keep neighbors from expanding their territory, borders must be constantly defended. The most contentious boundaries are those that lie between the two species. This herring gull pair must defend against a neighboring blackback. Yows are exchanged on both sides. The blackback advances in an upright posture. The herring gull dips his head in a facing away display, a visual signal of submission. When chicks hatch, territorial tensions increase as parents now have more invested in protecting their territory and the young within. A blackback next door is the main threat to this herring gull family. The mother herring gull yows an alarm. Her mate joins her. His keck kecks and mews fail to deter the blackback. The father turns to a display called grass pulling, grabbing and pulling on nearby vegetation as if on his neighbor's wing or beak. This may be displacement behavior, redirecting overflowing anger, or a ritualized display of aggression and strength. The blackback holds his position. With the survival of his chicks at stake, the herring gull charges upward. The blackback responds with an upright posture, a grass pole, and a lunge. The herring gull retreats. Diving towards the chicks, the blackback plunges into the vegetation below. Signals have failed them. The parent's last recourse is to fight. While blackbacks hold a substantial size advantage, this herring gull pair is highly motivated and fights tenaciously. They're defending their entire year's reproductive efforts. This pair prevails, at least for now, driving the blackback to the air. Territory defense is critical for successful reproduction. It takes a pair to defend a territory, and it takes a pair to raise young. The choice of a partner is a critical factor in determining the survival of each individual's genes. They'll make this important choice of mate through signals, and once coupled, they'll forge their partnership through effective communication. Herring and blackback gulls become sexually mature adults at age four. They spend their first three years as mottled juveniles, learning to forage from a broad range of sources on the mainland and at sea. The four-year-old survivors, now in adult plumage, return to their island breeding colonies. It's now, when they've reached adulthood, that the gulls develop their complete repertoire of signals. All gull displays are innate, but the way individuals order, exercise, and respond to displays is plastic. Older adults are practiced communicators, better able to use their signals to elicit the responses thereafter. But all individuals must make effective use of their repertoire of courtship and mating signals in order to find a mate and ready the territory for chicks. Almost all courtship and mating signals are used in multiple situations. It's critical that receivers know the context of each display so they can assess it and respond appropriately. 
This is especially true early in the season, when the singles scene coincides with the conflicts of territorial establishment. At this time of year, the long call means keep out to rival males. It's also the first step to attracting females. Long calls are also used by pairs to announce regular comings and goings to and from their territory, reinforcing their bond. The mew, used to attract a mate for support in territory defense, is also used to attract attention in courtship. Males mew to signal that they have a nuptial feeding to offer. Submissive postures are critical in agonistic interactions, and also for females when they first enter a male's territory. In addition to these familiar displays, new signals come into play. One such signal is the choke, an important display for pair bonding and for choosing a nest site. Head tossing is a signal that gulls develop when they are dependent chicks. It's retained into adulthood for the same purpose, begging. In early courtship, it's used by the female to elicit feeding. Once the pair is committed, the same display is used to elicit copulation. The one vocalization heard in a single context is the copulation call, made only by males while mating. These signals are the vocabulary of courtship and mating. And these interactions are the glue that binds the pair. The first phase of courtship is search and attract. Virgin and widowed females fly low over the colony, looking and listening. When a male's long call is not directed at a rival, it advertises territorial ownership to passing females. In repeated flyovers, females assess male's quality, availability, and the suitability of his territory. Most years, females outnumber males three to two, so they can't afford to be too choosy. Just finding an available male is tough enough. When she finds a potential mate, she lands carefully on his territory, quickly assuming a submissive posture. If she doesn't do so effectively, he may attack her as if she were an interloper or an encroaching male. A receptive male stands in an upright posture, alert but not aggressive. The female approaches hunched over, tossing her head, the begging signal. She is asking for him to feed her. She may also be inspecting the brightness of his eye ring and the quality of his plumage as possible indicators of his condition. She judges his interest by his continued acceptance. As her confidence in this potential pairing rises, she increases the vigor of her begging, cutting him off and tossing her head directly into his face. This exchange continues for 20 minutes or more before she gets what she wants, the regurgitation of some tasty food. More than just a meal, the first time the male feeds the female marks the beginning of their partnership, one that could last a decade or more. All great blackback and herring gull couples, including longtime pairs, repeat this begging and feeding ritual over and over. Each time, their partnership deepens. The male continues to demonstrate his ability to provision his family, and the female adds the weight needed to lay her coming clutch of eggs. Before laying eggs, the gulls have to fertilize them. Copulation will cement the partnership. The lead up to copulation follows a standard progression of signals and responses. 
In this context, it's the male who starts the head tossing. But it isn't food he's after, it's copulation. If she's agreeable, she joins in the head tossing. The male mounts, wagging his tail back and forth between the tips of her pulled back wings. This serves both for positioning and as a signal intended to increase her receptivity. He adds his copulation call to the tail wagging. If she agrees it's time, she continues to toss her head, looking up at the male and pulling at his feathers. All of these tail wags, copulation calls, head tosses, and feather pulling build to a crescendo. The pair couples in a cloacal kiss, the method birds use to transfer sperm. Not all copulation displays end with a mating. Either mate can stop at any time. This herring gull female is signaling her interest with head tosses, but her mate is unmotivated or distracted. Despite repeated urgings, he stops and jumps down. Still, pairs do mate successfully many times. Early in the season, they might mate a few times per day. Just before and during egg laying, they mate multiple times per hour. Each time, they repeat the same signals and responses. Communication brought the pair together, and communication is required to care for the forthcoming eggs and young. Next, mated pairs need to agree on a site to lay their eggs. It's an important decision that pairs make together. There's a lot of negotiation involved. Pairs walk around their territories indicating their preferences with the choking display. Here, a male suggests the spot above the grass while his mate checks out a spot below. He mews to get her attention then chokes to point out a site he prefers. She hops up to his location and responds favorably as they choke together. The pair will build a nest here. In the three to four weeks before the female is ready to lay, pairs often build several nests. In the end, they'll use only one of them, and in it the female will lay three eggs. With that, their investment in this year's reproduction grows. If they are to successfully rear even a single chick, they will need to communicate effectively to each other, to their chicks, and to their rivals. Once the female lays eggs, the couple share the task of incubation and nest defense. It will be about a month before the brood hatches. One parent must stay with the nest at all times, both to incubate and guard the eggs. If they leave the eggs unattended, a neighbor will eat them. So one parent forages while the other sits. This is the quietest time in the colony. The day the chicks hatch, everything changes. Parents begin a two-month, around-the-clock chick-tending marathon. Gull chicks fluff up within hours and are mobile and able to thermoregulate within a couple of days. But until they can fly and forage in other areas around the island, they depend completely on the meals their parents deliver. Not all pairs can keep up with the demands of parenting. 
In the 45 to 60 days from hatching to fledging, more than half of the chicks will die, mostly from starvation or injury. To find enough food, parents have to be effective foragers. To provision and protect their offspring, they must be effective communicators. Most of the displays in a gull's parental care repertoire are also used for territoriality or courtship. In this context, with young to care for, they take on new, if related, meanings. Signals of territoriality, such as long calls, charges, and the upright posture, are now used in offspring defense. Choking signals a preference for a place. Pairs used it to negotiate their nest site and now choke to elicit nest exchange. Adults use head tossing as a dogged request for food or copulation. As the chick's own begging display develops, they'll incorporate head tosses as well. Mates mew to summon each other. The same display is now used to recall the chicks who wander too far from home or to gather them for a feeding. The one signal used only in the context of parental care involves the red spot on the adult's bill. It serves as a cue to assist the young in finding food. The success of the season relies on the pair's cogent use of these signals of parental care. Mates trade nest duty every four to five hours. Usually, it's straightforward. But the drive to incubate is so strong that sometimes the sitting parent is reluctant to leave the nest. This female doesn't want to get up. Her mate brings her nesting material and chokes. She sits. Judging by the overbuilt nest, he's tried this signal a lot. Clearly irritated, he mews aggressively, but to no avail. Without better coordination, this pair is unlikely to reproduce successfully. If they fail because they couldn't communicate, they will likely look for different partners next year. Most couples do coordinate their way through the month of incubation. This blackback is sitting on eggs that will hatch in about a week. Though still inside their eggs, the chicks have already begun signaling. Beneath the parent, the chicks quietly peep through their shells. These sounds may be communication among siblings, coordinating their hatching. Two days before they hatch, chicks cut a small hole in the shell. Now the peeps are louder. Parents respond to the signal by focusing their foraging on food that's appropriate for hatchlings. Hatching itself is a grueling process that can take up to 12 hours. Once emerged, chicks are wet and exhausted. Within a few hours, they're alert and dry. Within a few days, they're mobile. These newly hatched young innately respond to the red spot on the parents' bills. This cue shows chicks where to find food. Pecking at the red spot may signal the parent to regurgitate, but the adult probably doesn't require the prodding. More likely, if the parent tolerates their pecking, it signals to the chick that a meal is imminent. Pulling the beak away signals that it's not time. At this stage, peeps and begging are nearly constant. The cycle of feedings puts a relentless demand on parents. 
Chicks are about 5% of their parents' weight at hatching, but will reach adult weight before they fledge. When the chicks are young, parents gather small fish and invertebrates, or plunge dive for prey they can pull apart, like crabs. Each time, parents return to ever more demanding chicks. As the chicks grow, the form of begging changes significantly. Pecking at the red spot and peeping gives way to head tossing and prodding near the parent's face. Parents must be tireless and opportunistic foragers. As the chicks grow, parents bring back bigger prey. Successful parents soon face three full-sized mouths to feed. Less successful parents may still struggle to feed one. By the time the chicks fledge, their begging now looks nearly identical to that of the females four months earlier. The form of the begging display is conserved into adulthood. To survive, chicks need both food and protection. At least one parent must stand vigilant guard all day and all night. Every possible threat is met with some form of aggression. Just as they did when they were battling for territories, gulls try signals before resorting to direct fights. But disputes escalate far faster now that parents have invested months of reproductive effort into this year's chicks. Here, a young chick has wandered into the path of some students. Its father treats every passerby as a threat with yow warnings and charges. Serious intrusions, like these biologists banding chicks, are attacked with more signals and lunges. The biggest threat to growing chicks come from other gulls. As chicks get bigger, they need more space to wander and practice their flight skills. Parents struggle to expand their territories against the long-established boundaries. Here, a herring gull chick strays into the neighbor's territory and is immediately attacked. It screams a shrill waver to its parents, who respond forcefully. This chick is lucky. Others are not so well defended. A herring gull sits on her nest while her mate repeatedly attacks the blackback next door. The blackback does not seem particularly threatened. It's hard to imagine what the smaller herring gull has to gain. The blackbacks have three chicks. His mate hears the clamor and responds, coming to aid in the defense. He charges the herring gull nest, flushing the female, revealing that her nest is empty. Herring gull chicks are nowhere to be found. A herring gull with no chicks to defend wouldn't normally risk direct attacks on its larger neighbor. Eventually, the blackback reveals the reason for the herring gull's distress. He has eaten all of the herring gull's chicks and now serves them to his own. It's a meal that will require a little more digestion before it's ready for these smaller bills. The herring gull parents will attend to their empty nest for a day or so before recognizing that this year's reproductive investment is lost. On Appledore, only one in 50 pairs manage to fledge all three of their chicks. Most fledge one or none. The fledged but still dependent chicks learn to fly and forage around the island. 
Even though they are fully grown, they are not safe. Here, a blackback adult is drowning a young herring gull that it knocked out of the sky. He feeds the whole chick to his own young, now old enough to pull it apart themselves. Half of all chicks hatched on Appledore die before they can leave the island. The half that survive carry the genes of parents who are effective foragers and effective communicators. It's those genes that have survived and those genes that will be passed to future generations. The signals shared by herring and great black bat gulls are deeply etched into their genes. In fact, the signals are older than the species. The displays evolved millions of years ago in a common ancestor, accumulating in the lineage when various movements, cues, and sounds became the ritualized, stereotyped displays that we see today. Over time, gull species have diverged, but the complement of behaviors has remained relatively unchanged. Evolutionary history means nothing to the individual gulls on Appledore. They need to communicate to find a territory and a mate, and to successfully raise offspring that carry their genes. Each generation must master the use of these signals, when to employ them, when and how to respond. Effective communication is crucial for survival. And communication begins with a signal. <laughs>